We held our breath and hoped for the best. The excitement, the tension, the passion. It was all still there as discovery blasted off, proving yet again that our love affair with space is as strong as ever. So imagine what it was like for the former astronauts, men who've explored the great unknown, who've walked on the moon. Well, Charles Woolley's been especially blessed. He was at Cape Canaveral for the Discovery launch and he spent time with those space heroes, looking back on their triumphs, looking forward to the day when 21st century astronauts head for Mars and walk on the moon again. <laughs> Even after weeks of waiting, there's nothing that can prepare you for the thunder and fury of a rocket launch. Nobody is unmoved. get to report so many bad things and the chance to be here at some kind of towering human achievement like this is really something. It's, um, it's surprisingly emotional. That was one of the coolest things ever. It just went up and then it took about 10 seconds and after 10 seconds you could just feel the sound and it was awesome. And after about 45 seconds they are gone. They must have had the ride of their lives. And it's still like that too for the real heroes of space. Those who went before. Lunar pioneers like Alan B. Something about the, the noise, the vibration and the fact that this device goes straight out more or less and then disappears into the heavens. Shot into space this week atop what scientists concede is nothing more than a controlled explosion is a team of seven astronauts, among them Australian Andy Thomas. This launch comes the same week the United States government has dedicated $34 billion over the next two years to revive the flagging space program. The dream is still alive. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. No one will be able to stop the dream because humans will always have the dream to go where they haven't gone, and they'll always have the dream to go as far as they can. But that attitude is definitely alive and well at the Johnson Space Center here where the astronauts train. They want to go. They want to do as much as they can. They want to go back to the moon. Alan Bean was one of 12 astronauts who walked in the moon. Although no one was allowed to souvenir bits of the moon, Alan Bean inadvertently brought back moon dust on the badges sewn to his spacesuit. For the past 25 years, he's been incorporating tiny amounts of this material into an endless artistic output. The theme is unchanging. Man in the moonscapes, recorded forever in paintings that sell for as much as 200,000 Australian dollars. Okay, I'm an artist now. Not near as important in many people's minds as being an astronaut. But I'll tell you this, when I paint well, at the end of the day, I have the same feeling in my heart of satisfaction that I had when I walked on the moon. And I think this is a nice thing for humans. You don't have to be an astronaut to get the best feeling any human can get. Spend a day in Mr. Bean's Texas studio and it's clear that he remains moonstruck, leaving us with a vivid impression of what it's like to walk on the moon. Up there, I weighed 50 pounds. <laughs> and so I could do everything so much better. I could jump higher. I could lift things. My, even my arm was easier to lift. It felt like the best day of my life because <laughs> I was so, so strong. I just could do things that I could never do. Was it in any sense a beautiful place? 
Well, in a way, a Buzz Aldrin Apollo 11 said it perfectly when he got out on the surface uh, in July of 1969. He looked around and said, magnificent desolation. And that's exactly what's there. There's nothing there but rocks and dirt, and they're gray and light gray and dark gray and black, and the sky's black and nothing is moving. So it's not as beautiful as almost any place on Earth. Famously, Alan Bean held the Earth between two fingers of his gloved hand. It was a defining moment, and a theme he constantly revisits in his art. And I could see the Earth above the lunar module, and so I just put my hand up just like that, and I could circle the Earth and put it right in there. So everybody, all, what, 6.4 billion of them were right down there on that little That's round amazing. ball. It was amazing to me, and it's scary too, because you're so far away. You're 240,000 miles away from everybody else, and you know that all your hardware's got to work. You know your hardware was put together by humans. They're not perfect, but you say, I hope that the people that put it together did it right. Houston, we have a problem. Well, the immortal words, that we uh, mentioned in the movie and also real life where Houston, it, it, we have a problem here. Actually first set by Jack Swikert. Okay, uh, we've we had a problem here. But when those words were received at the control center, there was a shift change going on and they didn't pick up the communication. This is Houston, say again, please. Uh, uh, Houston, we've had a problem. Then, then I said, Houston, we have a problem here. We have a main B bus undervolt. Ah, so you stole somebody else's lines and went into history. Oh, uh, yes, I took, <laughs> I took Jack's lines. And I've been trying to rectify that ever since. Jay, how are we doing? Captain Jim Lovell, the man who didn't get to walk on the moon but is all the more famous for that, runs a restaurant in Chicago with his son, Jim Jr. I would have thought that the food might have been out of this world and that the prices were astronomical. The prices are not astronomical, <laughs> the food's fantastic. <laughs> A fuel explosion on the way to the moon left Jim Lovell's vehicle, Apollo 13, damaged and its oxygen supply dangerously low. There seemed little chance of a safe return. We realized how serious it was when I looked out the window and saw escaping at a high rate of speed a gaseous substance and knowing that it was our oxygen on the, lunar mo on the command module and certain very soon we'd be out of oxygen. Quite honestly, were you scared at the time? Well, naturally, uh, I was ap apprehensive. I was scared. Uh, our chances of coming back were very s slight in the beginning. As we got over one crisis after the other, uh, our, uh, our confidence I increased. Our percentages of survival increased. And so uh, uh, you can only be scared so long, and then all of a sudden you have to get to work. Do you consider yourself uh, ever after a lucky man? Every day is a bonus after something like that. Yes, uh, I do consider myself lucky. I mean, my demise could have occurred back in April of 1970. Here it is, the year 2005. I'm still alive and I'm still breathing and I'm still enjoying life. And so crisis after Apollo 13 don't bother me. Challenger, go and throttle up. The Apollo 13 scare, then years later, two shuttle disasters, Challenger and Columbia, have made NASA and America jittery about the return to flight this time around. You know, uh, space flight is very risky business. Uh, things can always go wrong. We can always have human error. Uh, and if we uh, nickel and dime everything right to the nth degree, we will never fly. The people that fly, and I'm speaking, I think, for a lot of us in our philosophy of why we go up in these things, is the fact that the rewards are well worth the risk. If you'd asked me back then, I would not have uh, thought it would be uh, 40, 45 years before human beings were back on the moon. Harrison, better known as Jack Schmidt, left the last human footprint on the moon. And that footprint, how long will the footprint of Harrison Schmidt remain on the moon? 
probably a million to two million years oh, in well, recognizable form. But it's there for a while. You can certainly leave your footprints in the sands of time much more readily on the moon than most other places I can think of. Over here we have uh, one of the rocks of many that we brought back. Jack this was the Apollo 17 mission geologist and the only scientist to walk on the moon. He brought back 110 kilograms of moon rock and got to keep none of it. But it's quite beautiful. It has well, you can sparkle, see the sparkles, and those are little minerals of an iron titanium oxide called ilmenite. Unfortunately, we did not get to keep it. You any. didn't get, not uh, even a little but, bit. But really, it, that would not have been appropriate. One of the things that changed with me was the realization of what human beings can do when they decide uh, something is the most important thing they're going to do with their lives. And we had almost half a million Americans believe that uh, with Apollo. And when you have that level of motivation, anything is possible. And that, that realization really came to me after Apollo. What we learn about space from the people who've been out there is that in retrospect, it's not so much what the moon or even in time what Mars looks like, but more importantly, how the Earth looks from out there. Looking from the moon, as I look back, I thought, well, maybe the worth Maybe the Earth is the Garden of Eden, and we've all been given a shot at living there. We get to live our whole life on this beautiful blue and white planet with all these animals, all these other people, all these trees, all these bushes, all these bugs. Nowhere else that we know of has got any of that, and we've got it all. I think for the people that uh, uh, went up into space, especially those that went to the moon so they could see the Earth as it really was. They have changed their uh, thoughts about life. They thought of, and their, their existence on the Earth and, and what we have to do to, uh, to survive. Discovery by week's end, a docked with the International Space Station. For the old astronauts watching it all, the dream is once again alive. We shouldn't keep astronauts and space people from exploring space just because we personally don't want to do it. It's too risky. We'd rather be a bank president. Okay, stay there, do that, but let these others do what they want to do and what humans need to do. Humans need to do these things. Well, you have to have faith in what our space program is trying to do. Do I believe that we'll adventure out farther than the moon we did in 1960s and 70s? Yes. When? I don't know. Mars is a very strong possibility. I'm sure it's going to happen. Going back to the moon? Yes, I'm sure that's going to happen. And beyond too. Mars? Beyond Mars. The it's universe? Going be, it's going to be a long time. I was strolling on the moon one day. Jack Schmidt sang on the moon. Somebody else hit a golf ball. And some just look like they failed to appreciate the gravity of the situation. If mankind is to go to the stars, it's nice to know we'll take our sense of humor with us. And be advised that the switchboard here at MSC has been lit up by calls from the Houston Ballet Foundation requesting your services for next season. I should hope so. But maybe the greatest and most memorable thing about you, Alan Bean, is that you were the first man to eat spaghetti on the moon. Well, that's true. That's true. In fact, that's what, what an I, achievement. <laughs> it is. Nobody liked it because it didn't taste anything like spaghetti as we know it. But I wanted to be the first human to eat it. Someday when they bury me, I want on my tombstone the first human to eat spaghetti on the moon. I'm Sarah Arbo. Thanks for watching 60 Minutes Australia. Subscribe to our channel now for brand new stories and exclusive clips every week. And don't miss out on our Extra Minutes segments and full episodes of 60 Minutes on 9now.com.au and the 9now app.